Well, it's a very short passage. It's a couple of verses, but let's take those words that Ruth spoke to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And we just read them a moment ago, and Jen just now sang them for us as well. Let's listen to those words. Ruth says, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge or where you stay, I will lodge or stay. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. This is a passage that is commonly read at weddings. Perhaps it was read at yours as well. When my wife and I got married, we had this in our wedding vows. It is a passage that speaks of unwavering commitment, although in its proper context, it really doesn't have anything to do with romantic love, of course, because it's from one, you know, it's from Ruth to her to her mother-in-law. It's it's what it's these are family bonds. But deep down, it's about love given in which there is no expected benefit. In other words, unconditional love. Love with no strings attached. A love that is purely for the sake of the other person. One of the things that social media has brought us, and we all agree that social media is both a blessing and a curse, is that social media has revealed to us just how utterly dissatisfied with life that many people are. How do we know that? Because they wear their feelings on their sleeves and they post it for the whole world to see. We can see their pictures, and we, we can read their opinions. We, it, it's out there for everybody to see. Go on your computer and go to any of the social media sites and just read what people put up there. Underneath every one of these posts, most every one of these posts, is an underlying plea that that person is making. They're saying, please, world, love me like my post. I want somebody to love me. I suspect that I'm preaching to the choir again this morning in more ways than one because you all are very well aware of why so many people are dissatisfied with life. You know it all very well because you see it. People are dissatisfied with life because they have not been receiving the return from life that they've been expecting. Maybe they've invested a lot in life, but they haven't been quite getting the return, the return that they think they should get. Most things in life are transactional. We enter into them with the expectation that we're going to get something back, right? We give in order to get. We love in order to receive love. We're nice to people and hoping that they'll be nice to us. The reason that people get disappointed then is because they're not getting the return on their investment. What we're looking at today, though, is a form of love that we've all heard about many times before. But yet, it's important enough that we need to hear about it once again, and it's love in the Christian sense of the word, love. And it comes from that Greek word, agape. You probably have seen the English translation of it, which, or transliteration, which looks like the word agape, and many people pronounce it uh, agape, but the Greek pronunciation is agape. And it differs markedly from other forms of love, other forms of love that people people usually think of. Agape is a self-giving love. It is one that is entirely selfless, and it's entirely for the benefit of the other person who receives it. There was a, a young woman, let's just say that her name was, was Jane. She fell in love with a handsome young man and on the evening that they were to be married, Jane collapsed in a nervous breakdown. 
And at first they thought that, well, she was just exhausted from all the wedding preparations and Jane just needed a long rest. But as time wore on, it became more and more apparent that her condition was rather serious and Jane had to be committed to a psychiatric ward in a hospital where she sat in her room day after day after day after day just staring off into space, not even responding to people that came into her room. Just staring there, not speaking, not making eye contact, just pretty much zombie light staring off into her, into space, day after day, week after week. And her, she didn't even respond to her psychiatrist. In one day in frustration, her psychiatrist confided in a friend of his who was an artist and told him about Jane and he said, well, would you mind if I visited her and see what I can do with her? And the psychiatrist said, sure. And so the artist started going to visit Jane every day in her hospital room. And he would just go into her room, not say anything, and he would sit down in front of her and he would hold this, this lump of clay and Jane never, she didn't respond to it, didn't even look, didn't even seem to indicate that she was aware of his presence. But day after day, this artist would come in and do the same thing, and he would begin where he would gently work the clay with his fingers. And he did that week after week, and even month after month, until one day, finally, Jane reached out and she touched the lump of clay, and that was the beginning. That was the beginning of a breakthrough. The artist would return the next day and the day after that. And eventually, Jane would respond even a little bit more. And one day, the artist, he hadn't been saying anything. Keep in mind, all he did was go to Jane every day and just hold this lump of clay that one day she touched. And he would just let his actions do the speaking for him. He was just gently working. And one day the artist spoke and he said her name. He said, Jane. And she looked up and there was a moment of, of recognition. Sometime, it, it was like she heard her name spoken to her for the first time in months. And then she took the lump of clay and that she started doing that every day, and that lump of clay became a bond between the two of them. And Jane started to work it into shapes. And keep in mind now, the artist still hadn't said anything to her yet, except her name once. But she started working with this clay, and then one day, the clay wouldn't form into the mold that, that she wanted it in. So in a moment of frustration and anger, she slammed it down on the table, and she pounded it with her fist. And the artist just smiled and he put his hand over hers and he said, you see, Jane, I like you. You don't have to worry when things don't go right because it's all right. And Jane looked up and Jane herself spoke the first words she had spoken in many, many months. She said, you like me? And that began a breakthrough where Jane's recovery, the pace of her recovery, picked up rapidly. And she eventually made a full, complete recovery back to normalcy. Notice the, the care and concern and patience that that artist, how he approached Jane each and every day, that is agape. He didn't go in there demanding that she respond to him. He simply presented a lump of clay in his gentle presence. He didn't demand a progress report from Jane. He didn't demand any type of benchmarks. He just simply made himself available. He didn't demand that Jane acknowledge him or do something to feed his ego. Instead, he simply placed a lump of clay at her disposal. And he did this at great personal risk. He didn't know how Jane was going to respond. 
For all he knew, she might not ever respond. She might flat out reject him. Or she might respond positively, as we know from the story that she did. And she recovered. You know, that's how God deals with a whole human race. Is there any artist that's greater than the Lord God? I mean, my gosh, look out the window. Really, look at life. Is there any artist, any modeler that's greater than the Lord God? In each and every day of our existence, and this holds true for every person on planet Earth, God Almighty, from our, the moment we open our eyes in the morning, comes and sits in front of us with this lump of clay. And this lump of clay for you and me represents a new day in which we've been given to live. And many people respond differently. Some people completely ignore it. Or they don't even seem aware of God's presence in what God has put in front of them. Others take it and try to do something with it. Others take it, and when it doesn't turn out the way they think it should, they slam it on the table and, and hit it with their fist. But either way, God comes to every person on this earth with an incredible level of patience in agape, unconditional love, and presents us with a new day in which to live. I think one morning this past week, well, Every morning, my wife and I always sit by the, the living room window and we look out the window while we have our morning coffee, trying to wake ourselves up. We used to start the day off by watching the news, but we don't do that anymore because I would find that I was always driving into the office mad, you know, from what I saw in the news. Uh, we just decided not to start our day that way anymore. The news can wait a little bit, like a few hours, because um, I found that watching the news in the morning is kind of like watching a natural disaster you can't do anything about. So when we pull the drapes, if I see the neighbor's house is still there, and I don't see billowing smoke from any place and hear sirens or see foreign paratroopers dropping in the front yard, I figure things are generally okay for a little bit and the news can wait, but we were just sitting there drinking our coffee and looking out the window. And my wife said to me, she said, you know, God sure, puts up with a lot of stupidity from people, doesn't he? And I say, yeah, he does. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, and I'm one of those people whose stupidity God has had to put up with before. And I'm sure she met herself as well. But it's really true. God is incredibly patient with the human race. Incredibly patient and loving. And God comes to us new every morning with that lump of clay and says, here you go. Here's a new day for you in which to live. And of course, so many people don't respond positively to the Lord God. You do, that's why you're at church or why you're watching on live stream. You do, of course. Again, I'm preaching to the choir. But the Bible speaks of God's patience. Numbers chapter 14, Exodus 34, Psalm 86, Psalm 103, 2 Peter. It's all over the scriptures. God is incredibly patient with people. And God's love is incredible. The love that Ruth had for her mother-in-law, Naomi, the love that that artist had for a mental patient named Jane, and the love that the Lord God has for you and me and every other member of the human race. And finally, once again, we remember a man named Daniel Walks, who in this church and in this community loved people with a love that he really didn't expect anything in return. And today we make a contribution to the fund that bears his name. As God's people, you and I now go back into the world that God so loved unconditionally. And may you and I do likewise. Amen.